Okay, so I'm Phil Howard, um, and I'm going to make a case for relativistic programming. Um, but before we talk about programming, let's talk a little bit about the real world that we live in, um, some of the discussion we've already had today. So I've got bubbles up there. The, the kind of bluish ones are events, and the reddish ones are observers of those events. And if we think of the events as a flash of light that's going to propagate out in space, um, so there we, we have the, you know, that bubble of light propagating out in space. And from your point of view, you could conclude that both of those events happened at the same time because the bubbles coming out are the same size. And since light propagates at a fixed speed, if the bubbles are the same size, from your point of view, the events must have happened at the same time. But if you look at observer one, it's observed event one, but it has not yet observed event two. So observer one would conclude that event ha one happened first, and observer two would have, would have observed the other way around, that event two happened first, and then event one, because it's seen event two. Um, if we think about causality, and what do we mean by causality? Um, in this case, event one is gonna, is gonna be the cause for event two, and what that means is that event two must have observed event one and then responded to that observation in order to cause event two. If we look at the bubble diagrams, if event two is causally related to event one, what that means is that the wave front from coming out of event two has to be entirely contained inside the event horizon for event one. And as a result, there can be no observer that could see event two without having also seen event one. And that's, that's essentially what we mean by, by causally related. So there's an assumption here that there's a constant propagation speed regardless of the distance from the event. And, and here I'm, I'm, I'm talking about light events. And so yes, light is, is, is traveling at a fixed speed. And you're absolutely right, that, that's, a, that's an assumption here. Um, Given that, that assumption, there's, a, there's this triangle inequality where the sum of two sides has to be greater than or equal to the third side, where the equals case is the degenerate case where they're all collinear. And, uh, and so in this case, if we think about time to get a message to here, this one has to arrive no later than this one arrives. And again, that's preserving causality. So if um, I don't know what that extra thing is up there. Um, so if computers were just wires, we would be okay. Now that's a simplification. If computers were wires where everything was connected by a straight line connection, we would be okay. But of course computers aren't that. Now let me back up a little bit. The thing with wires is you can have a coil of wire sitting on the floor which delays. And so again, if we had straight line connections, we would be okay. But computers, in fact, aren't wires. They're wires plus, the hardware guys would say, logic. Um, we being concurrent programmers, we have to say that it's illogic. And so let's look at what we mean by that. Um, and so here we have um, a linked list, three elements in it, and we're going to add an extra element into that linked list. And the code to do that, and I happen to be a C programmer, and so we'll do this in C, you allocate some memory for the node, you initialize the data, the payload, if you will, and then you connect the next pointer from C, so it's pointing at D. And having done that initialization, now you can go ahead and have B point at C. And in the sequential world, you can look at that and say, yeah, life is good. That ought to be a good way to do it. And, and so even if we're running concurrently, if in fact things happen in this order, that ought to be safe concurrently. But as concurrent programmers, we know that it may not happen in that order. Some of the discussion earlier, the compiler can rearrange things. Even if the compiler leaves you alone, the hardware can rearrange things. For example, if uh, B happens to be in my cache and C happens to not be in my cache, when the compiler goes to do this, it says, oh, I need to get the cache line while I'm waiting for the cache line. Is there something else I can do? Oh. I can do this one because B happens to be in my cache, so I'll do that one while I'm waiting for the cache for, for C. How unlikely is that? If you think about it, we've read node B, so we had to acquire node B. Node C is sitting somewhere else in memory, so in all likelihood it's not in my cache. So that may in fact happen quite often. 
In relativistic programming, we have a primitive, RP publish, and its purpose is when you publish this pointer, insist that all this other stuff has already gotten to memory first. Um, whether that's a memory barrier or whatever else is required to do that. When I think about the RP publish, I think of it as kind of a, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a clarification question. When you mean this is safe for concurrency, you mean uh, for concurrent readers? For concurrent readers, yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think of RP publish as kind of a local operation. Um, and Paul and I have had this discussion that it isn't necessarily local. But the way that I think about it is the, the, the compiler and the, the CPU can do that without having to explicitly communicate with other threads. It's a matter of make sure this goes to memory and then make sure that the, that the b.next goes to memory. Let's think about one that's a little bit more complicated. Here we have that same linked list, but now we're going to turn around and delete node C. But of course, when we delete node C, it hasn't really gone away. We've unlinked it, but we haven't freed up the memory yet. And we really can't free up the memory yet because a reader may have a reference to that node. And so if I free the memory and reuse it for something else, bad things can happen. But notice that once we've unlinked C, any new readers that come along can't obtain the reference to C. So if after we unlink C, if we wait for all pre-existing readers to go away, it's now safe to free that memory. And so again, we have this primitive, wait for readers. So we unlink, um, unlink C, wait for all pre-existing readers to go away, and now it's safe to free C. With those two primitives, we can actually accomplish quite a lot. Um, the discussion we had from this morning thinking about the, the atomics and what things do you need to make atomic and how relaxed of, a, of an access you know, can you get away with, um, with those two, with the two primitives, wait for readers and the RP publish, there's actually only two fairly simple rules. And if you follow these rules, you get a, you get a great deal of safety properties. So the two rules, when we write globally vis visible pointers, we use RP publish. If you think about the create the link, create um, inserting a node example, while you, prior to inserting the node, you can think of that as being a local copy. It's not necessarily globally visible yet, and so you don't need the RP publish, but once you link it into the list, it's now visible, and so you need to use the RP publish. Second rule, a little bit more complicated, when you perform two writes, one earlier in traversal order and one later in traversal order, you separate the two with a wait for readers. Concrete example. We unlinked the list here, and the, 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 the pointer that we changed was in B, and then at some point in the future, we're going to free up the memory for C. Well, the memory here is later in traversal order than the memory there, and therefore we need to use the wait for readers between them. If we had a case where we did it the other way around, where we changed something here, and then we changed something earlier in traversal order, you can do that without the wait for readers. So two can fairly you, simple. Can you, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm sure you're correct. It doesn't make sense to me. That might be readers. OK, so, so let's suppose we were going to change this, and then later on change that one. Um, we want to preserve causality. And if you observe this change, you necessarily have to also observe that change because it's later in the linked list. And so you don't need to do any extra work to preserve that causality. Okay, so your mission is to preserve causality. Preserving so causality. Correct, necessarily. Um, we, can, we can preserve quite a number of correctness properties, but here I'm simply addressing causality. And my claim is if you preserve causality, you have necessarily preserved a bunch of other correctness properties. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about what those are. But can I just briefly ask, my concern is that if you free B, then even if that's independent of B, someone might still try to access it. OK, but if you free B, you have to unlink it first. And that's, and that's something earlier in, in the order. Okay, and so that, that implies that you need to wait for readers between them. What's that? Or you have a pointer to B that comes from someone else in the list. I'm assuming that you have a data structure that has a, that has a traversal order. Um, if you have a, a map with loops and a bunch of other things, this doesn't apply. So I'm assuming a data structure that has a traversal order. For this work, you're kind of not allowed to hold on to pointers after you've traversed the node. 
Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so, so what's the meaning of waits for passage? It, it waits until all readers that existed at the point you started waiting have finished. So if new readers come along after I start to wait, I don't care about them. Readers of what? What's that? Readers of what? Readers of this data structure. Let me get to it. Let me get a couple pages in, and I think I can make that a little more clear. So let's keep going here. Um, so we looked at that one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at two examples. One is a relativistic red-black tree. Another is a concurrent AVL tree. Um, and the AVL tree was taken from this paper. I chose it because it's fairly recent. Um, they claimed high performance and they showed good scalability. So I want to look and compare those two implementations. I obviously don't have time to look at all the details, but let's look at um, a piece of the code from that paper for the concurrent AVL tree. I know that's microscopic. I don't expect you to read and understand it all. Let me just point out a couple of things. When you, so this is, this is doing a lookup into the AVL tree. When you do a lookup into a tree, you would expect to have some kind of a loop, and each time through the loop, you go one level down in the tree, and that loop necessarily has to end when you get to the bottom of the tree. This code has a loop, um, but if you can see it, it's not while I haven't gotten to the bottom, it's that it's while true. That looks an awful lot like an infinite loop. Next thing I've highlighted here is this return retry. And so we're going along doing some stuff, and I don't have the option of it either found the node or concluded I, it's, the node's not in the tree. I have this third option that says, oh, you need to go back and try again. And again, the, the, not, not that you can necessarily see that, but the condition in that retry is if node.version x or node v bitwise ended with it nor grow is not equal to zero, then you return retry. Can I see the show of hands for those that know what on earth they're trying to do there? That's what I thought. Um, some other things here, there's a, a, a call to wait until not changing. And so before I can go to the, to the child, I have to call this wait until not changing. And that sort of seems like a race condition because even if this returns, how do I know that it hasn't started changing before I go in here? And so there's another one of those node.version xor node v bitwise and ignore grow return retry again. Eventually, we get to this thing where we recurse on get attempt, which repeats the infinite loop, repeats all of these retry things. And I think the guys that did this are geniuses because they got it to work and got good scalability. Um, but I don't want to have to maintain that code. So here's the equivalent um, in relativistic programming. And there's this start read call and end read co call down here. The stuff in the middle looks an awful lot like code that you would use if you were using locks. So once you've announced that I'm going to read, the code in the middle looks like locking, um, or looks like locking <coughs> code, except for this RPD reference, which is the read side of the RP publish. Those two together um, give you uh, dependent read consistency, is what, what, which is what we want here. Comment on the start read and the end read. Both of those calls are constant time, low overhead calls. Unlike a lock call, which is not constant time because if somebody else has the lock, you tend to wait for it. So we have a low overhead constant time uh, call to start and end the read, and the code in the middle looks like locking code. Um, that perhaps is unfair to look at that because relativistic programming shifts a lot to the right side. So let's look at a right example. If you're gonna delete a node in a tree, if we want to delete that node, what you do is you move this node here, which is the leftmost node in the right branch, up into its position. This isn't a class on trees, so just take on faith that that's what you do if you don't remember your data structures class. So we're going to move that one up into that position. The interesting bit of the relativistic programming code is right here. First thing I want to point out at the top, rather than moving the actual node, we're going to make a copy of the node and put the copy in the place up above. Um, the rest of the code looks an awful lot like, again, the code that you would use with a, with a locking solution. The only difference is we use RP publish to set the pointers, and then we do the wait for readers here in the middle. And again, the reason for that is we're going to make a change up here, putting the copy there. And then later in traversal order, we're going to remove the, the node. And so we need the RP, uh, or the wait for readers in that case. 
So again, very simple code. There's no retry loops. There's no any of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's easy to understand. Let's look at performance. What I've got here is um, three implementations. The reddish one at the top has no locking whatsoever, no synchronization whatsoever. A read-only workload that's safe. As soon as you throw a writer in, it, it's not safe. The blue one in the middle is the relativistic programming, and the black one at the, at the bottom is the concurrent AVL tree. Um, there's two sets of, of uh, data superimposed here. Um, the open uh, ones are all of the threads are doing reading. The closed one, there's one thread trying to, one thread writing as fast as it can. Back to your question earlier, why do you have uh, you know, computation in the middle? There's no computation in the middle. All of the other threads are doing reading. The thing I want to point out here is in all three cases, that writer didn't interfere with the performance of the readers. Back to this one, again, I'm really impressed that they got that to work. That's the expected behavior of relativistic programming because the readers simply announce I'm reading with a constant time thing and then go and read the node. And, and that's the expected behavior. Update behavior, this is the update behavior of that one thread that's doing updates while all the other threads are doing reads. Um, you notice even with no lock, there's a degradation there um, because of cache pollution, uh, or not cache pollution, but the <coughs> other threads um, taking away exclusive access to the, to the nodes. Um, relativistic program, again, far outshines um, the CCA VL one. Um, so the benefits and the conclusion here is with relativistic programming, preserving just causality, not preserving anything beyond that, we get high performance, highly scalable reads. And again, when you look at an algorithm, you need both. The CCAVL gave you good scalability, but terrible performance. RP gives us both. It gives us simple code, and it gives us fairly strong correctness properties. And what I mean by that in the discussion of uh, this uh, workshop, if the answer for a strict locking solution is five, the answer for an RP solution is still five, not five plus or minus some epsilon. Um, so we can preserve those properties. The only thing we give up is what order do events happen in, really glad the last talk came before mine, because we give up ordering, but what we've seen is you actually wind up, same as they saw, with the, with the faster updates, you actually preserve order better when you consider uh, start times. So I'll throw it open to questions. Yes? Very interesting piece of work. But again, that's my question about, you know, what if you had a point coming in from here. Do you have some language restrictions to, to force programmers to be using data structures that have these traverse orders? I mean, if you write arbitrary code, say you write this movie thing that you said you can't support, what does the system do? Okay, so Next, so you've done that and say yeah, I'm not doing this. So uh, we've looked at relativistic data structures, and we've only done data structures which have a fixed traversal order. And do you mean that you you encode the traversal order, or is it just so if if you have if you have a tree, a lookup has a traversal order. You start sure. at the root of the tree and then you go to the well, leaves. You have a way of saying I'm using a data structure with a traversal order. Correct. Correct. You have a way of formally describing the data structure. Any any data structure that has a fixed traversal order with no loops, we can fairly easily do a relativistic implementation of it. So did you sorry to lay the point, but you mean that if you write some arbitrary code that just happens to have these properties, things will work, or do you have to write non-arbitrary code and specify these properties somewhat? Um, I believe, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I believe the answer is you can't write arbitrary code. You have to use particular algorithms for particular data structures well, to preserve the Can I struct tree node in the usual way, you know, and write a C structure that is a tree node, but I don't have to tell your system it's a tree node? Uh, one, way to, one way to answer that question is that there are, it, there's a very large number of instances of this type of algorithm in Linux kernel, so I have to answer to give you the answer yes, it is possible to write code in this form. That may not be exactly what you're asking, so, so let me answer it this way. Here, here's, the, here's the update one. If you just had your struct tree node and said, go do it, no, it would not give you relativistic properties because in cases, you need to wait for readers thing. 
Oh, and you've got to make sure that you do the RP publish thing rather than just assigning pointers. So yes, you have to write particular code in order to preserve these properties. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, well, go ahead. So, can you go down? I can't see one of your slides. Am I going to the slides? Yeah, well, what's the no lock do? There's no synchronization whatsoever. Why don't you use that one? Because um, <laughs> that doesn't preserve the same correctness properties that the relativistic programming one preserves. Okay. Second question, you, you can't, aren't there specific rules when you have to put in these constructs? Uh, repeat the question again. Uh, there, it, it seems like you, you, you told me that, that there are specific rules that govern where you have to put these constructs. Correct. You can't you automate the placement? Probably, we haven't looked at that yet. Okay. But what you wouldn't be automating is evaluating whether the algorithm is of the type where that's going to work. Okay, let's, let's pull this into the group discussion and, and stay on the timetable at this point. Good points. Sir.